Now, I want to tell you something. I want everybody to look up here at me. I want to talk to you for just a moment. Now, back when I was in, in seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, some pastor buddies of mine, we used to go work out at this gym. Um, and it was, uh, it was called uh, Balloons Gym. Okay? Now, let me tell you, it, it had some hardcore people in there. All right? I mean, it, it had some guys shooting some steroids. There's some big guys in there. Okay? Now, the reason I tell you this is because it was owned and operated by these two, two brothers, uh, and, and they were Jews, okay? Super nice guys, as nice as you could ever want to meet, but I want you to understand something. But yet, they were very resistant to Jesus and the gospel message. Now, obviously, being close to the seminary, Seminary guys were always going there trying to, trying to witness to them, okay? But I want you to understand, they weren't receptive at all because to them, their Bible ended at the Old Testament. They didn't want to read the New Testament. They didn't want to hear about Jesus. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. I, I think they got a lot of it from, the, from their dad. But super nice guys, but they didn't, they didn't want to fool with that. And the reason I tell you this is because... They're a modern-day example of what Paul is going to talk to us about the Jews in our text this morning. Verse 14, Paul begins with a series of rhetorical questions. And he's going to use some important verbs as a chain of verbs. And here's the thing. Although he's talking really primarily to Jews, but there is application for all people. Okay? Now, now. Important stuff as we, as we get dig into this. Now, let's pick up chapter 10, verse 14. Now, Paul writes, he says, How will they, now the they there is referring to the Jews specifically, all right? But it can, ref, it can apply to anybody, but it's specifically for the Jews. He says, How will they call on him, that's Jesus, how will they call on him in whom they have not Believed, there's the word for saving faith. I put it in your outline, pistuo, all right? He says, and how will they believe in him who they've not heard? And, and how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Now, now think of the logic here. you got to reverse it. Think backwards you got to send them to preach so people can hear. And if they can hear and believe, then they can call on Jesus. And what happens to them? They get saved. Okay? So that's the logic there. Now, let's continue. Paul says, just as it is written. This is Isaiah 52, 1, Nahum 1, 15. I love this. How beautiful are the feet now, you don't usually think about feet being beautiful, do you? Okay, I'll say more about that in a moment. It's kind of quiet. All right. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring or preach uh, good news of good things. However, they did not all heed or obey the good news or the gospel. For Isaiah says, here's a quote of Isaiah 53, 1, talking about the Jews. said, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Some translations will have God. It's not a big deal. Same, really the same thing. By the word of God, by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they, talking about the Jews, have never heard, have they? And God says, indeed they have. Here's a quote from Psalm 19.4. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. But I say surely Israel. Now notice he mentions Israel here by name. Israel did not know or understand, did they? And God's going to say, yeah. He says, first Moses says in Deuteronomy 32, 21. I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding. I will anger you. 
Verse 20, and Isaiah is very bold and says in Isaiah 65, 1, all this is in your outline. I was found by those who did not seek me, talking about the Gentiles. I became manifest of those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, here's the Jews again. He says, now here's a quote of Isaiah 65, 2. Here's God speaking. All the day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate or contrary. King James says gainsaying. We don't understand what that means. The word literally means to speak against something. It's literally what it means. That they're speaking against God. So all the day long, God says, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient, obstinate, contrary, you could say hard-headed people. Father, I pray for the next few moments, take away distractions. I pray you'd speak to every heart, Lord. We all need to hear this. And again, Lord, I pray that if there's somebody listening to me that's lost, that today they'll be saved. And Lord, for all that you do, we'll give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, notice in your outline, as we work our way through the text, we're going to talk about two main things. First of all, in verses 14 and 15, Paul's going to explain to us about the necessity of human proclamation. Okay? And what he's going to talk to us about is that we all have a responsibility to share the gospel. Okay? Now, folks, I want you to let me kind of just tell you this that I want you to think with me that even though Paul has told us. That God is sovereign in in election and he chooses people. He predestines people to be saved. It's a work of God. But yet, now everybody look at me. I want you to see this. The main primary way, the main method, the main means, the main strategy that God uses in calling lost people to himself. Now listen to me. is through God other Christians and the church somebody say amen okay now now that means we got to share the gospel now I'll be honest with you you've heard me say this before you may not remember this but if I were God and of course I'm not it's a good thing I'm not I'll tell you that but if I were God I don't think I'd have chose it to do, to do it this way. I think I would do something different. Of course, he doesn't call me and ask me what I think either. Okay? But if I were him, I, I would peer back once a month up in the sky and just say, Hey, look at me and, and see me and be saved. But he doesn't do that because what God does, he has chosen. He, his strategy is to use saved people and use the church and spreading and and evangelism okay now it's kind of scary when you think about it now let's go let's begin reading again verse 14 having said that he says now don't miss this how will how then will they as we said the Jews how will they call on him Jesus in whom they have not believed now, notice your outline. I put this word believe here in verse 14. It's the word pistuo, and it's the word for saving faith where you literally put all your weight, all, all that you are on Jesus and his shed blood and what he's done at the cross, what, what, we have, what we've sung about this morning. And so he says, and how will they call on him whom they have, have not believed? And how will they believe Pistuo again in him whom they not heard? And how will they hear, now get this, without a preacher? Now realize that, that the implication here is that God is going to send people into people's lives and, and, and help them come to, to hear the gospel, okay? And what I want you to get here, now listen to me, the focus is really not on the preacher or the messenger or the one sharing the message. The one bringing the message doesn't matter. What the focus here Paul is talking about is the message itself, 
which is the gospel. Okay? Now let's look at verse 15. Don't miss this. Notice he continues to, he says, Now how there will they preach unless they are what? Sent. The implication here is that God sends people to share the gospel. Now notice the next part of verse 15. Paul's going to quote from the Old Testament to prove his point about God sending people. Now look what he says here. Now how will they preach unless they're sent? He says, just as it is written. Now here's a quote of Old Testament prophet Isaiah 52, 7. Also, there's something from Nahum 1, 15. Don't go look now, but you ought to go back and look. But here's the quote. And I love this. Here's the quote. How beautiful are the feet. Now, now, you remember a minute ago I said, we don't usually think of feet being beautiful, do we? You know, I'll, I'll just be honest. As a guy, you know, I look at a girl, a, a beautiful lady, I'm going to, I, it's probably not going to say, well, boy, hasn't she got pretty feet? I mean, I don't care how pretty your feet are ugly. And, they're, and, 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 you, and you use them to, to walk on, right? Okay? But notice he says, these feet are beautiful because it's really not about the person it's about the message see look what he says how beautiful are the feet of those who bring or preach the good news of of good uh, things so what we see here is Paul takes this Old Testament uh, uh, scripture and that was normally applied to the Old Testament Jews and hearing good news. And he applies it to, to the gospel and to Jesus. And he says, it is so beautiful. You, you, it's beautiful feet of those who bring it. Now, I want to make this really practical because it is so practical and applicable to us today. Okay? Because you could read this. And I'm sure you, somebody might be sitting out there and thinking, well, wait a minute now, Pastor Jim. I, I'm not a preacher. I'm not been called like you. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a missionary. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not one of those. But let me tell you something. If you are saved, then everybody that is saved, you have a responsibility to help share the gospel. Okay? In fact, you could put it like this, and this is why I gave this title to our study this morning. Did you, did you look at the title? Don't, don't skip the title when you're looking because I don't just put it there just for decoration. You know what the title says? Do you have what? Beautiful feet. I hope you read that and think, what? Well, you know what God says? You have beautiful feet if you help get the gospel out to people. Now, I want to be honest. Now, now, I'm going to step on your toes a little bit, but I'm stepping on Jim's toes too. But most Christians never really share the gospel with anybody. In fact, there's a lot of people who get saved. They go all their life from the time they're born into the kingdom to the time they die and go to heaven. And they never tell anybody. It's one of the least things we do. If I ask you to raise your hand this morning, if I said, now how many of you have been on your phone all week looking at news, reading stuff, talking to stuff, texting to stuff, everybody in here would have to raise their hand probably. But if I ask how many of you have shared the gospel or have invited somebody to come to church and made a difference in the kingdom doing that, I wonder if there would be anybody could raise their hand this morning. Now, I'm not trying to fuss at you, but I want you to understand, we'd all agree, we'd say, but sharing the gospel is the main thing, right? We're reaching lost people, discipling saved people, but we do so little of it. And I think the main reason is, is fear. We're afraid and let's be honest, it's scary sometimes to try to talk to somebody and share the gospel, isn't it? Now be, somebody say yes. Say yes. Don't act all spiritual. And as a pastor, there's times I've chickened out. And you say, you've chickened out? There's been times when I, after I've gone, I thought, you know what? I should have shared it, and I didn't. But I want you to understand something. 
Uh, I want to give you four ways. I want you to fill this in. Now, I got I to gotta move quick. But number one is that you just got to... You just got to practice it. Fill it in. Practice it. Okay? All right? Now, wait a minute. That, that, we got a mix up right there. Put practice on it. Okay? And what I mean that, you just, you just got to do it. You got to be intentional. You got to, and, and, and what you can do is at least invite people. And, and like I said last week, you ought to be able to share your testimony. You ought to have about a 30-second testimony where you can just say, Hey, Jesus has changed my life. He wants to change yours. Why don't you come and meet me at, at church? We, we would love to have people, our folks, would love on you. You know what? 30 seconds. And you never know how that may change somebody. So first of all, we want to practice it. Okay. All right, I'm going to have to do a good job of making sure I proof my stuff better. All right. Number two is participate. Okay? Yeah, we got that right. All right? Be, and when I say participate, be fully engaged. Notice that. Be active. Come to church. You are to be, if you're not in Sunday school, you need to be in a small group. Jesus preached to the multitude but he poured his life into 12 guys. So, so you need a small group. We've got some great teachers here. You need to get in there. And, 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 and when you come, you want to be positive. You want to be encouraging. You don't want to walk in here with a sour face. Sometimes I look out here and you look like you're waiting in the dentist chair. I want to go smile. It's not that bad. And, and we want to be p people who are open to doing what it takes to reach people. Let me tell you, as long as I'm the pastor here, I tell you this. We will not ever change this book. We're going to stay by the book. All right? But we're not going to make our church. So many churches have become museums mausoleums because they're locked down. We don't going to change. And you know what? There are a lot of churches that are dead. Tradition will kill you. Do we change the message? Never. Do we change the method sometime? We need to. Because listen, what's important is not us. See, you got to tell yourself all the time, it's not about me. It's not about me. And it's not about Pastor Jim. It's about Jesus and the gospel. All right, this leads to the third thing. Now, i got so much more I want to say, but number three is pray for the lost. Our Wednesday night prayer sheet, if you don't come to preaching, I mean, to prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and you can, you're to come, 6.30, and, and we have a prayer sheet, and we have blanks at the top for lost people, and I have about 22 people I'm praying for to be saved. You're to have a prayer sheet somewhere and you're to pray three or four times a week for people that you know are lost. Maybe family members, maybe a mate, maybe a child, a grandchild, a co-worker. Not only do you need to be specifically praying for them, but you ought to be praying for opportunities that the Lord would give you to talk to them about it or somebody else. See, you got to be intentional. Just doesn't happen by accident hardly. Okay? And then number four, and this is very practical... Is pay for it. What I mean is give tithes and offerings to the church because, first of all, you know what? How many of you enjoy heat in the winter and, and air condition in the summer in the church? Come on now. Yeah, come on. I know you like it, right? Well, you know what? We don't get it for free. How many like sitting with the lights on? I like, yeah, yeah. hey, we got to pay for it. Hey, and, and, and you know what? Your staff, we really like getting paid. It's kind of nice to get a paycheck. Okay? I got a house to pay for. And I thought I'd got rid of my girls and got them off the payroll, but I didn't figure this thing out. You never get your kids off the payroll, do you? I found that out. And now I've added a grandchild, but, but I'll pay for her. Okay? All right? Right? Now let me tell you this. 
And when you give to the church, we give a portion to the North American Mission Board. We'll take a special offering up for around Easter. We do Lottie Moon at Christmas. But we also give during the year, and it helps missionaries stay on the field. And when you give to your church, when you give tithes and offerings and give to these mission offerings, and I don't ask for a lot. Every, almost every Sunday, the Southern Baptist Convention has an offering to take up. You can take up an offering for this and that. And I purposely don't do I really do two things. I do Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong. And then when we do a building thing, and we're going to do that kind of soon, I'm going to challenge you on that. But on that, I don't, I don't do it because I don't want to hit you up for money all the time. But when it comes to missions, it's worth it because people get saved. Now, i got to go on. I'd like to say so much more. But let's go to our second main point. Now, first of all, Paul has talked about the necessity of human proclamation. We need to be sharing the gospel now, secondly, in 16 through 21, he's going to talk about the necessity of human response. And here Paul is going to focus our attention on the Jews' resistance to the gospel. Now, let's begin verse 16. However, they, the Jews, did not all heed or obey. Now, you could translate this the good news, or you could translate it the gospel. I put it in your outline, verse 16 there. It's the word euangelion. And if you look at that word, you see in the root our English word evangelism. Okay? And see, this is good news. The gospel is good news because it tells about Jesus. So he says here, that they did not all heed the good news of the gospel for Isaiah says. Now here's a quote of Isaiah 53 1. He says, Lord, who has, who, the notice he says, who has believed our report? So the Paul, point here Paul makes is that not many Jews would respond to God's call on their life for faith and salvation. And here's what I want you to understand. The Jews were hard-hearted against God in Isaiah's day. He wrote 700 years before Jesus came. Now listen to me. Fast forward 700 years to the first century when Jesus was here. And guess what? They were still hard-hearted towards Jesus and the gospel. And here we are more than 2,000 years later... And it's still true today that for the most part, the Jews reject Jesus and the gospel. In fact, if you go to Israel now, most Israelis, are, are a lot of them, are, they, they don't believe anything. They're atheists or they don't practice Judaism. But let me tell you something that's really interesting. But now we're starting to see more and more Jews get saved, which I think is a sign that we're in the last days. Okay, now, notice verse 17. Paul once again emphasizes to us what he said earlier, that, that people, that they, they, to hear the gospel, they got to know about Jesus to be saved. Look, he says, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God. Now, put this in your outline and this is worth knowing. The word translated here is not logos. Usually when you see the word talking about Jesus, it's usually logos. But notice in your outline, the word translated here is rhema. R-H-E-M-A. It's pronounced rhema. And the word rhema means that which is spoken, that which is, which is spoken out loud and communicated, it's preached out loud about Jesus. So notice what he says here. He says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the rhema, by the word of Christ. And, and, and what he says here is that, that Paul's point is that when people Share the gospel. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Everybody look at me, and I want you to make sure you get this. This is so important. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're a pastor and you're preaching to a congregation on Sunday morning, just like I'm preaching to you right now. 
Or it doesn't matter whether you're a Sunday school teacher and you're teaching. Or it doesn't matter whether you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a teacher at work or, you're, or whatever you do at work. Or you're in the grocery store and you're sharing the gospel. What you got to understand, the power is not within us, but it's within the gospel message itself. See, in just innately inside of the gospel message, it, it is resonating with divine Holy Spirit power and unction that God uses through the Holy Spirit. And so it's not really us, but it's the message that we carry. And I want to tell you, if you ever help bring somebody to pray to be saved, you'll never, ever get over it. You'll never be the same again. But you got to realize, it's not what we do, it's what he does. Now, i got to move quickly. But notice in verse 18, Paul again focuses our attention on the Jews' rejection and their disobedience. Now, look, look at verse 18. Now, notice what he says here. But I say... Notice he says, surely they, talking about the Jews, he says, they have never heard, have they? Then look what God says. Now, don't miss this. Indeed, they what? Have. Now, Paul says, have they heard? God says, yes, they have. Now, have they heard? Well, notice Dave, that Paul's getting ready to quote Psalm 19.4. Important Psalm. And I want to read it. And then I want to explain something to you. Here's the quote. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. And their words to the ends of the world. Now here Paul uses a quote out of Psalm 19 verse 4 to say yes that the Jews have heard of the gospel and they do not have an excuse they can't claim ignorance now as I mentioned to you a moment ago Psalm 19 very important Psalm in fact I hope you remember this I preached two messages on it back in August of 23 so it hadn't been that long ago now why is it important because King David wrote it a thousand years before Jesus came. And in this psalm, what he does, he explains how God has revealed himself to two main ways to the Jews. Okay? Now, now, everybody listen to this. In Psalm 19, verse 1, here's what it starts and it says. Don't turn there, but it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Okay? Now, two blanks in your outline. Fill this in. First of all, we call this, now fill this in, general revelation, or we call it natural revelation. We've talked about this when back when we were in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. And here's, here's the basic thrust of general or natural revelation. Now, I want you to make sure you get this. What, what, what David says here is that you may have grown up where you have never ever had a Bible, never been to a church, never knew anything about God. But what David says, but man can still look at the cosmos. He can look at the universe and look at the world. And everything that is created is evidence. It is proof the creation screams that there is a creator that's general revelation in fact Paul says in Romans 1 everybody's without excuse nobody can say I didn't know there's a God and you know what the more we learn in science the more technology we have the more we learn how complicated life is on a cellular level it couldn't have just happened by blind random chance evolution is a lie and, and they know it they just, they, they, it just becomes a religion to them. Okay? Now, look at the second blank. Now, now, not only did David mention 
general or natural revelation. Then he mentions, now fill in the blank, special revelation. What special revelation? Well, that's the revelation that God gives to people through his word, through the Bible. Now, now, folks, unlike the Gentiles, the Gentiles had general revelation because, but the Jews had both general revelation and, and special revelation because God gave them the Bible. So they had even less of an excuse to say, I couldn't believe uh, than, the, than the Gentiles did because they had both general and special revelation. Now this brings us to 1920 and notice Paul gives us another example of how the Jews rejected the gospel. Because in verse 18, David says, they rejected both general and special revelation. But look at 19. He says, but I say, surely Israel. Now notice he specifically calls them out by name. He says, but I say, surely Israel did not know or did not understand, did they? And God's going they could have, but what, what, what notice he says, but first Moses says. Now here's Deuteronomy 32, 21. Here's what, he, here's what God says. I will make you jealous, talking to the Jews, by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding, I will anger you. So what he's doing is saying, you won't listen to me? I'll turn my gospel to the Gentiles. Now look at the next verse. Look at, let's read verse 20. Here's a quote from Isaiah 65, 1 to further prove that the Jews should know. He says, and Isaiah is very bold and says, Isaiah 65, 1, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. So, folks, what Paul does here by quoting Deuteronomy and by quoting Isaiah, he says that if these lost pagan Gentiles who did not have both general and special revelation, if they could come to me and believe in Jesus and be saved, then surely the Jews should have and could have, but they didn't, not because there wasn't evidence. It was because they refused to believe. Okay? They did not want to believe the gospel. Now, in case you noticed, I want you to notice it, in case you missed this, Look at 21, and Paul drives, really, he drives the final nail in the coffin about their hard-heartedness because they can't say they didn't know and didn't, didn't, wasn't appealed to. Because look what, now notice he's going to quote Isaiah 65 too. All right? But as for Israel, so he mentions Israel again. But as for Israel, he says, this is what God says. He says, all the day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate or contrary people. So what Paul says here is that God says that rejection of Jesus and the gospel, listen, wasn't because there was a lack of opportunity. No, it wasn't because they couldn't understand. No, but it was because they willfully, they chose to be disobedient to Jesus and the gospel. In other words, what the Jews as a whole said, we don't want this Jesus, this gospel stuff. We're going to earn our salvation ourselves by keeping the Old Testament law. Now, let me say a couple things. Kind of wrap this up, but I want you to listen to me. This is important. I want to, say, I want to explain two things. Now, everybody look at me. I want you to hear this. First of all, by the Jews rejecting the gospel and by the Gentiles receiving the gospel, neither of these two things shocked or surprised God at all 
Because as Paul's been telling us all in chapter 9 and here in chapter 10, quoting the Old Testament scriptures, he's been telling us that that God knew it was coming. He even predicted it through the Old Testament prophets because it was actually a part of God's preordained gospel plan for the world that the Jews would reject it and the Gentiles would receive it. Okay? Is everybody with me? But here's the paradox. Here's the antinomy, the thing that doesn't seem to make sense. But here it is. The Jews were still held responsible and accountable to God for not believing because, listen, they had the opportunity to believe. And you see, God's election does not negate or cancel out man's responsibility. Is everybody with me? See, when the gospel's put out, we need to respond. Now, secondly, let me say this. I want you to make sure you get this because here in verse 21, in this quote of Isaiah 65 2, the Bible paints for us now this vivid word picture of God. Now, let me, everybody look up here and see this. Here's the word picture. Now, theologians call this an anthropomorphism. Boy, that's, that's a big word. It makes me sound smart, isn't it? That's, let me give you this anthropomorphism. That's just a fancy way of saying they make God look like a human being. It's like a father. And basically what in this text, what God is saying, that like a father with outstretched arms, he's been calling continually over and over again, incessantly inviting the Jews to come to him through Jesus and the gospel and to be saved. And he wants them to come and be saved. Okay? But realize, this is where it gets personal and practical for us. Now listen to him because the devil doesn't want people to hear this. But by the Jews as a whole. Now some Jews got saved because Paul's going to tell us that next time. Because he's, he's a Jew. But because as a whole the Jews rejected the gospel, guess what? That made the gospel, boom, bounce out to us. And we can be saved. Now, we ought to be thankful because, like I said the other week, I doubt we got any Jews in here. And if they are, he'll save you. But we're all Gentiles. Hemi, are you glad that the gospel went to the Gentiles Better say yes, amen. And here's the thing. God may be speaking to somebody right here, right now. Maybe they're in here. Maybe they're watching online. And and, and through his Holy Spirit, God's pleading with you to come and be saved. Then there may be somebody that's saved, but you know you need to be baptized. And That's an act of obedience. It's so important that once you're saved that you followed up with believer's baptism. Or maybe God's been talking to you about coming and joining this church. And you keep saying no. And God's going, what's the deal? And then there there may be somebody in here today. And the Lord's dealing with you. And he's telling you, I know what you've gone through. I know the valley that you've been in. I know the pain, the problems, the trials and troubles that you've been in. But if you'll just yield to me, if you'll just surrender to me, and if you'll just let me handle it, but you got to do it my way. Isn't it hard to do that, to let God have his way? Because we want it. We want things our way, don't we? Well, see, God's not going to arm wrestle with you. You got to come to him and you got to do it his way. But if, you, but, if you, but if you ever give yourself over to him, you'll see that it is the best way. Mm-hmm.